Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. This episode is part of our series on Stalin. It's episode 11, The Big Three and the Bomb. In the summer of 1944, it was the turn of the Red Army to launch a strategic offensive in the warm weather. This was Operation Bagration, named after an old Tsarist commander. Now, it was the Soviet T-34 tanks that were the invincible armoured columns, and it was the German high command that failed to anticipate where the main thrust of the attack would come. This time, it was through Poland, Hungary, and Belarus. When you read the Nazi war diaries from the fall of France or Barbarossa, quite often you get a sense of elation in extraordinary victory. Here, that same elation is tempered by hatred and the desire for revenge. A grim fact of the war is that, as conquerors often have, the Red Army engaged in mass rape of women. As many as two million German women were raped as the Soviets advanced on Berlin. Stalin, for his part, had a sanguine, philosophical attitude towards this horrendous crime. When the leader of the Yugoslav resistance to the Nazi occupation complained to Stalin about these rapes in Yugoslav territory, he was happy to justify their behaviour. He said, You have of course read Dostoevsky? Do you see what a complicated thing is man's soul? Well then, imagine a man who has fought from Stalingrad to Belgrade, over thousands of kilometres of his own devastated land, over the dead bodies of his comrades and dearest ones. How can such a man react normally? And what is so awful about his having fun with a woman after such horrors? You have imagined the Red Army to be ideal, and it is not, nor can it be. The important thing is that it fights Germans. End quote. The bizarre mix of empathy for the soldiers and utter disregard for the horrors inflicted on the civilians in the war leaves you wondering how much Stalin really cared about either. This was a sanitised version of his real opinion, to please the Yugoslav partisans. Stalin's real attitude was more reflected in a briefing by Marshal Zhukov as his troops approached Berlin. He said, We have not forgotten the pain and suffering done to our people by the Hitlerist cannibals. We shall exact a brutal revenge for everything. It is true that the Red Army would have seen enough evidence of the Nazi Holocaust, and known enough first-hand evidence of the destruction of Soviet lands, that they could have little compassion for the nation they were fighting. But the fact that he was willing to use this as a justification during the war. Almost everyone who came through the war, on either side, ended up being a victim or a participant in mass violence. They had all witnessed some of the most horrendous scenes imaginable. Yet it is the people of Poland who suffered the most. As the Red Army liberated more and more of the territory of Eastern Europe, and it became clear that they were occupiers as much as liberators, Polish patriots of the Polish Home Army rose in rebellion. This was the Warsaw Rising, a desperate attempt by the Poles to liberate their capital from the Nazis. They did so in the full fear and knowledge that the Red Army invaders would reconquer and resubjugate them even if they succeeded. The Rising was timed to coincide with the Red Army approaching the city, but the Red Army advance stalled as the Rising began. Now this has been debated endlessly in the historiography of the war. Soviet commanders like Zhukov insist that the Red Army was never in a position to take Warsaw, but there's some damning evidence, the fact that they refused radio contact and refused to supply the Poles by air, and they refused to reinforce them, and all these things suggest that Stalin was perfectly happy to let them fight, and let Polish resistance and patriotism be crushed by the Nazis. After all, we have to remember that he organised the massacre at the Katyn Forest to do just that. This way, the Nazis might be held responsible. Regardless of whether the Red Army was genuinely incapable of helping the Poles, or if this was just a strategic move, and declassified documents from Soviet archives do suggest that Stalin did want to cut off the Poles from outside help, the results were awful for Poland. The Nazis crushed the Rising with military force, and as many as 200,000 civilians were killed, with most of the rest being deported. Fanatical orders demanded the total destruction of the Polish capital, with the horrendous figures of the SS taking charge, and the USSR did little to help. It should be pointed out that the RAF and the US Air Force resupplied the Poles by air, while the Soviets were only a few miles away. I once listened to the story of a concentration camp survivor, a man who was a young boy at the time of the Warsaw Rising, 
but was still drafted into the Polish home army and threw a grenade or two before being captured. Shipped further west into Germany as a prisoner of war, he wound up in a concentration camp. By this stage, late in 1944 and early 1945, the exterminations had become even more schizophrenic than before. In some regions they stopped entirely, while in others, fanatical SS officers redoubled their efforts. The man was simply left alone without food to starve to death. When the Allies liberated the camp, he was in a room full of bodies, too weak to move or make any sound. The only reason his life was saved was that a soldier happened to notice that, unlike the others, he was still breathing. A return to Poland meant a return to Soviet occupation, which was only lifted in 1989. I met that man when I was 15, seven years ago. Chances are he's dead now, but uh, he spent the later years of his life at Auschwitz telling that story to everyone who came to see. After the defeat at Kursk in 1943, and the opening of a second front by the Western Allies, the Second World War might as well have been over. It was becoming increasingly clear that the Wehrmacht had suffered permanent reverses in the field, and the massive defeats of Operation Bagration hastened the decline. But this was no ordinary war, it was fought as a war of extermination with near unprecedented brutality. And this as much as anything else is what led to its protraction. The German soldiers felt they had no choice but to fight on, in the hope of defending home soil against the terrible retribution that was doubtless coming. Average citizens may have been unaware of the extent of the violence on the front and the extent of the Holocaust, but they are under no illusions that invasion and occupation would be painless. I mean, these people had listened to years of propaganda talking about the ravenous communists who were going to kill them all. And Hitler, spiralling further and further away from reality, became obsessed with the Gottendammerung, the twilight of the gods. ...he had in mind for them, then they would be annihilated. He was determined to take as many people down with him as possible. The traditional sign-off from Stalin's daily orders, which read, Eternal glory to the heroes who fell in the struggle for freedom and independence of our motherland, and death to the German invaders, was closer and closer to reality. As it became clear that the war was being won and lost, Stalin's attention and that of his Western counterparts shifted to what would happen after the war. None of them were under any illusions that their alliance would last for longer than it took to defeat Hitler. Communism and capitalism were fundamentally opposed ideologies, and frays in the relationship had already begun to develop, for example, in the different responses to the Warsaw Uprising that was described last time. Yet Stalin, despite public posturing, was convinced that there was not going to be another war. He said, People are tired of war. No war is possible for at least the next 20 years. The democracies would not elect warlike leaders. Indeed, Churchill was booted out in 1945 by the British electorate, probably because they thought he wasn't the man to lead the peace. So, you know, Stalin was right about that. Stalin always admired Churchill, considering him the strongest of the capitalists. And when, at one of their conferences, Churchill explained to Stalin that he might not be in power after the war, saying, you see, we have two parties, Stalin, with his sardonic wit, noted that one is better. Even in autocracies, public opinion can be important. If Stalin had insisted on using the Red Army to roll into France on ideological grounds to turn them into communists, he would surely have risked an uprising in his own country. So it was clear that some kind of new equilibrium would have to be established when the fighting stopped. It was this, as much as anything else, that was the focus of the conferences between Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt, the big three leaders, that took place during the war. Stalin and Churchill actually had their earliest conference in August of 1941, when Churchill visited to state that there would be no chance of a second front being opened up any time soon. He didn't realise it at the time, but the luxurious building that Churchill was put up in was Stalin's own Dhaka. The conference got off to a terrible start because of the lack of a second front, which, at a critical phrase of the war, was not taken well by Stalin. Reportedly, after feeling insulted, Churchill wanted to storm off before he'd been scheduled to leave. But eventually the two got on better after Stalin charmed Churchill with a few personal touches, a drink in his apartment, and letting Churchill meet Svetlana. The first Big Three meeting took place in Tehran in November 1943, which was as close to neutral territory as it was possible to get at the time. Stalin was reportedly deeply unnerved when his plane hit an air pocket. One has to consider that he was hardly a roving leader, preferring to stay in Moscow with his holiday Dakar. 
and the nature of the Soviet state meant that diplomatic trips to other nations weren't especially common. He had a well-documented fear of flying, and very rarely went in an aeroplane. The meetings took place in the Soviet embassy complex in Tehran, and naturally every room was swarming with various bugs. These meetings are fascinatingly complex, and historians have focused on them since with good reason. As humans, I think we're always better at understanding, or maybe just more interested in, the human intrigue on small scales rather than the large-scale strategic movements, or long-term trends and forces. Providing you have more than one friend or family member, you'll understand the complexity of the dynamics that can evolve between three people. Each of Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt represented era-defining rulers of their country, undoubtedly great minds and remarkable individuals. And each of them arrived with a different set of biases, a different agenda, and a different point of view on the best way of expressing that agenda. And the questions were not minor ones. Was there going to be a second front? When and where would it be opened? How much credit could the United States extend to the other two nations? How would Germany and the other Axis powers be dealt with after the war? After all, the Treaty of Versailles had practically led to the Second World War in a lot of people's opinion, so that was not a minor question. What would happen to the Eastern European countries, both those which Stalin had occupied because of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with Hitler, and those which the Red Army would surely end up occupying as the war progressed? Roosevelt, for his part, was concerned that Stalin would clam up, view the capitalists as teaming up against him and issuing ultimatums. For this reason, he attempted to side with Stalin against Churchill on a number of occasions. The tactic worked, and Stalin had always admired Roosevelt and seemed personally fascinated by him, even though he probably respected Churchill's defiance more. Both Stalin and FDR had the capacity to be incredibly charming when they wanted to be. Indeed, there were many people who, based on their meetings with Stalin, had a wonderful impression of the Bolshevik. I mean, here's an example. There was a young private who, at the height of the war, uh, took to soothing his nerves in the Russian manner with some vodka, and one day he came in to deliver a report to Stalin unexpectedly after a drinking session. And, uh, you know, he slurs his way through this report, and uh, Stalin says to him, Have you been drinking? And the young man goes, Yes, yes, I have, comrade Stalin. And he says, well, that's fine, just don't do it again. So you can kind of see the sort of avuncular, jolly nature of Stalin in this quite serious situation here. Um, and you can kind of see why a lot of people were willing to attribute the greatest repressions of the terror to Yezov and Beria, because he could be charming when he needed to be. In the manner of all psychopaths, I suppose. His closest associates and confidants, however, had a more rounded view. Of course, geopolitical considerations, as well as personal charm, came into play. Now, you have to remember, at this time, the British Empire was still considerable. They still controlled India. FDR mentioned that India was ripe for a revolution, which was surely a mark designed to please Stalin and undermine the British Empire. Of course, the Empire was against the American ideal of self-determination that had been the dominant philosophy they expressed at similar negotiations for the Treaty of Versailles because self-determination would mean that the British Empire would break up. An infamous episode happened when Stalin remarked, 50,000 or perhaps 100,000 German officers should be executed to prevent the country from rising up again. And in there you can see a similar line of repression to Katyn that he wanted to do to Germany. But Churchill, he took offence to this. He said that the British public would never support the execution of honest men who'd fought for their country. Roosevelt, playing for an audience of one, joked that maybe they could get away with only shooting 49,000. Churchill was offended and tempted to storm off, but Roosevelt and Stalin reassured him that they were only kidding. However, that year, Beria and his security forces would arrest nearly a million people in the liberated territories. I'd be willing to bet that well over 50,000 had been executed already. If you think that maybe they could have come up with slightly funnier punchlines while they were debating real people's lives, I'm with you all the way. Yet this incident was indicative of Roosevelt's desire to curry favour with Stalin at Churchill's expense. Another recurring theme of the Tehran Conference was Stalin's habit of showing his dominance and power over the state by tormenting his underlings. Molotov, Beria and others all came in for criticism and were frequently the butt of diplomatic jokes. Stalin never ceased to enjoy reminding people of his power. The main results of Tehran were the agreement that the D-Day landings would take place in 1944, 
But another interesting aspect was that the Allies agreed to fund and support the Yugoslav partisans, communists who were fighting the Nazis behind their own lines. Now, the state of Yugoslavia had been set up in the Treaty of Versailles as a sort of buffer between Russia and Germany, ensuring that neither of them was too powerful. But here they were essentially ceding them to the communists. They had essentially become quite a thorn in the side of the occupying forces. Churchill noted that the Yugoslav partisans were holding up almost as many German divisions as the invasion of Italy had done in 1943. Their commander was one Josip Broz Tito, and one day I hope we'll do a series on him. The borders of post-war Poland were also discussed, albeit hastily on the last day of the conference. The real carve-up would come later on. The one purpose that I can see that there was for continually fighting the war was that it allowed in some cases for German civilians and soldiers to surrender to the Western Allies rather than the Red Army, which would usually result in better treatment. In the corridors of power, the fate of millions was being decided. Not that the negotiations did all that much aside from keeping the peace. Stalin knew that if push came to shove, his armies would be the ones occupying the territory that he wanted to claim, and there would be very little that the democracies could do to protest against it. Churchill at one point negotiated what he called a naughty document with Stalin, where the two divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, the inevitable precursors to the Eastern Bloc and the Iron Curtain that would divide Europe. I mean, this naughty document was on the back of a newspaper. In the end, though, the stipulations of the document made little difference. Stalin was able to do pretty much everything he wanted. The conference at Yalta took place in February of 1945 and the focus had in turn entirely to the post-war settlements of Europe. Once again, they all arrived with separate agendas. Roosevelt, who knew that the atomic bomb was close to completion, but had no way of knowing that it would end the war in the Pacific, needed Stalin on side to win that war. It's easy to forget with the way that history turned out, but the US Army had battle plans drawn up for an invasion of the Japanese mainland, and given the kamikaze tactics and stolid resistance of the Japanese which was intensifying as the war approached closer to home territory. Millions of American soldiers would likely have died. In fact, Roosevelt was able to negotiate at Yalta an invasion of Manchuria, the region of China that Japan occupied. This invasion took place on the 9th of August, three days after the first atomic bomb had dropped on Hiroshima, and hours before the second was dropped on Nagasaki. So the Japanese unconditional surrender was not entirely due to the atomic bombs, although of course they played a huge part. Important factors that were often forgotten, alongside the Russian invasion, are the extensive, demoralising firebombing raids on Tokyo that took place before the atomic bombings, which killed more people than the nuclear weapons did, and the Japanese knew that they'd be facing a war on two fronts against Russia as well as the US. Churchill was principally concerned with democratic governments in the countries under Soviet occupation, especially Poland, which was really why Britain had entered the war in the first place. For his part, though, Stalin was not going to let that happen. You feel that in 1945, the carve-up of Europe was for completely different motivations than when Lenin had championed the invasion of Poland in 1920. Then, the socialist ideology was front and centre, and this was an internationalist tactic to spread the revolution. Now, Stalin wanted a buffer zone of territory to prevent future invasions from affecting Russia, and to increase the power of his empire in general. Yet he was willing to pay lip service to the idea of democracy, saying, The Soviet Union is interested in the creation of a mighty, free, and independent Poland. But as we all know, the writing was on the wall with the massacre at Katyn, and the one that the Red Army had failed to prevent in Warsaw. But Churchill seemed to believe that Stalin's promise of free elections was real. He said, Poor Neville Chamberlain believed he could trust Hitler. He was wrong. But I don't think I am wrong about Stalin. The naivete of this statement might seem astonishing now, but we have to remember that Churchill didn't know what we now know about the Stalinist regime. It's also fair to say he didn't have much of a choice. Regardless of intentions, the net result was that the Polish government in exile, and the Polish pilots who'd flown alongside the RAF during the Battle of Britain, were sold down the river. Another dark underside to the settlement negotiated at Yalta was that the Big Three agreed that all the Russian prisoners of war including Cossacks and other minority ethnic groups, would be repatriated. In a lot of cases, this massive transfer of prisoners of war put them straight back into the grim apparatus of the NKVD, and it meant arrest, torture and execution. After all, not one step back 
Roosevelt was also heartened when he came away from Yalta with the promise of Japanese intervention, as well as the fact that Stalin had agreed to take the USSR into the United Nations. With the benefit of hindsight, it's obvious that Stalin was just toying with the idea of the United Nations to please Roosevelt. He negotiated favourable terms, such as the veto that all members of the Security Council would have, allowing the USSR to defend its own interests. In fact, it used 109 out of 128 of the vetoes before 1973. And, as well as this, Stalin negotiated that individual socialist republics of his occupied countries could be admitted to the UN, stacking the deck in his favour. But the precedent was clear at this point. I mean, the League of Nations had been established after the First World War for the same when it suited them, left when it suited them. Stalin's apparent concession to joining the UN was completely empty. He probably felt that if he ever needed to, he'd just leave. And in a nuclear age, when the war starts, the UN is not going to have much of an effect. As well as the master statesman, or at any rate the statesman with the biggest army, he also showcased the aspects of Stalin's personality that had become so familiar to us. When the Pope discussed, Churchill said they should make him their ally. Stalin replied, yes, all right, but how many divisions does the Pope have? It was an old joke of his, which he liked to repeat all the time. But the triumph of force over ideals says everything about the motivation behind Yalta. It's ironic, really. Here's a man who came to power on a sweeping Marxist revolution, the idea being that the thought, the word, the concept of freedom, socialism, equality, was more powerful than all of the institutions of state. And yet, here he is now, running that state. And he's the man who thinks that words, concepts, like freedom, are, are useless compared to force, in just the same way as the Tsar would have done. He took the opportunity to humiliate Beria by comparing him to Himmler, whose vast holocaust was beginning to be revealed. And, in another dark hint of things to come, he was aiming this probably at the increasingly prestigious Marshal Zhukov. He said, The services of the generals are quickly forgotten after the war. Here's to them. After the war, their prestige goes down and the ladies turn their back on them. And yet, at the same time as humiliating the people who'd served him, he even displayed genuine sympathy behind closed doors for the ailing Roosevelt, who he admired. He said, what did Roosevelt do? Why has God chosen to make him this way? So it's, it's a bizarre quote to hear that from Stalin. When Roosevelt died a few weeks later, he was upset, and Stalin would later unfavorably compare Harry Truman, Roosevelt's successor, to his old favourite. At Yalta, the underlying menace of the Red Army and the de facto control of so much territory meant that Stalin held most of the cards. A member of the delegation summed it up. It wasn't a question of what we would let the Russians do, but what we could get them to do. However, he wouldn't hold all the cards for long, because the US were just months away from successfully testing a nuclear bomb. Two months later, in the bunker, Hitler, Goebbels, and others committed suicide, and the little-known Admiral Dönitz was elevated to the position of Führer. Unconditional surrender was quickly negotiated as the Red Army already occupied Berlin, which had been defended by the press-ganged elderly and the Hitler youth. Hitler did not succeed, as he had hoped, in bringing the entire German people down with him. In terms of the leader's reactions, Churchill reportedly said, I must say that I think he was perfectly right to die like that. Stalin's response was a little bit more blunt. So that's the end of the bastard. Too bad we couldn't take him alive. What had been billed as a clash of ideologies, fascism versus communism, or could be viewed as a clash of titanic historical figures, Hitler versus Stalin, had really, of course, had far less to do with any of these factors than people liked. It was a class of nations, populations, and armies. The Soviet Union had been utterly devastated by it, with as many as 27 million of its own citizens killed, easily more than every other nation combined except for China, and fully 14% of the pre-war population. In occupied regions, the figures were far worse as they faced the double threat from the Nazis and from the Soviets. As many as a quarter of the Belarusians died in the war. The retreating Nazis systematically destroyed towns and villages, and millions of people were displaced. The USSR was victorious, but it had suffered damage that would take decades to recover from. Yet the victory in Berlin was surely the zenith of Stalin's career, 
For defeating the Nazis, he has received the grudging admiration of history and historians. Victory in the war, after the fact, has been used by many Stalin apologists and close comrades to justify the worst excesses of the pre-war regime. The Great Terror was necessary in order to win the war. The chaos and disruption of the five-year plans was necessary in order to rearm the country to win the war. The Great Terror had unified the USSR and prevented the regime from being toppled in order to win the war. Now, the idea that the five-year plan was necessary is far more valid than the idea that the Great Terror was necessary. You probably guess by now that I'm not keen to absolve Stalin of anything. It seems clear that the idiosyncrasies of his personality meant that the world was filled with far more violence and far more destruction than it would have been otherwise. And although it's a fun game to play, engaging with counterfactuals is a dangerous game as well. What if, for example, Trotsky had prevailed instead of Stalin? The insistent focus on international revolution would have probably led to violent conflict. If Bukharin and the rightists had continued with the NEP for longer? It's perfectly possible that the Soviet economy would not have been capable of producing the armaments in order to win the war. Leaving aside philosophical considerations about the ends justifying the means, though, I don't think you can make a good argument for the Great Terror. The evidence is damning that both the purges themselves and the culture of fear and refusing to question authority that they created were hugely detrimental for the USSR, and the Red Army especially. The evidence for any genuine conspiracy was almost entirely fabricated. It seems unlikely that there would have been a vast cadre of pro-German fascists in the Soviet Union without the purges. And as we have discussed, Stalin's personal interventions in the war, his selection of backward-looking generals, his failure to anticipate Operation Barbarossa, and his failure to anticipate the attack in the Caucasus, did more harm than good. At the same time, we shouldn't compare Stalin to an unreasonably ideal military planner. If Tsar Nicholas II had, improbably, still been in charge in 1941, you feel that his government would have been toppled. He probably would never have even had the pragmatism to compromise with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which did buy the USSR two vital years. His decision to stay in Moscow with the Wehrmacht a few miles outside the city, when Beria and the like were screaming at him to evacuate, may have been an important factor in the critical point that the city was held. And the brutal, ruthless methods of the Bolsheviks and the Soviet system. It's difficult to say whether they made accomplishing short-term logistical miracles, like the reinforcement of Moscow from the east, easier or more difficult. But a simple analysis of the facts is enough to throw serious doubt on the idea that Stalin deserves the level of credit that he got for winning the war. Ultimately, we don't know what would have happened if he wasn't in charge. That's why history is so interesting. There are millions of variables and far few measured outcomes. We only get to run the simulation once, and then endlessly argue about which factors were the most important ones. All these caveats aside, the final victory at Berlin was the highlight of Stalin's career, and doubtless also the highlight of his life. Whatever Marxist ideology might say about him being just another comrade, and whatever his pragmatism in the 1920s, portraying himself as a lowly general secretary, might have shown to the world, he loved glory as much as the next time. This was probably shown even in the early days of his Civil War command. He started secretly training to take the victory parade on horseback, but, as his son confessed to Zhukov, father had been preparing himself to take the parade, but the horse bolted. Stalin, a little bit sheepishly, upstaged by a horse, let Zhukov ride the horse in the parade instead. There is a great deal of Roman history in these proceedings. The parade sounds exactly like a Roman triumph, with the flags and banners of the enemy trampled underfoot by the victors. Nazi flags were thrown at Stalin's feet. He was fated as a hero, the saviour of the Soviet Union, the conqueror of fascism, and the victor in the war. This was the zenith of his power, influence, and respect on the global stage as a statesman. His finest hour. The eyes of the world were fixed on the provincial nobody from some unknown village in Georgia. The complete control and micromanagement that Stalin had engaged in throughout the war, and the immense psychological stresses he'd undergone over the last 20 years, took a considerable toll on his health. At this point, he was 66 years old. Indeed, Svetlana Stalin reports that he had a mild heart attack just after the war, and he became increasingly reliant on trips to his doctors. He was declining. To even think this, let alone suggest it, was an incredibly risky prospect. But even Stalin had begun to talk about retirement. Like so many autocrats, the centralised nature of control does not lend itself well to regime change. Could you really run a Stalinist system by committee? So as soon as the war was over, even though nobody could possibly dare to speak about it, the succession games between Stalin's underlings began. Zdanov was Stalin's favourite. Molotov had been with him the longest. Beria 
controlled the vast security apparatus of the NKVD. One person who was a possible successor to Stalin, despite his popularity and own personal merits, was Marshal Zhukov. Stalin probably already suspected and mistrusted him as he watched him ride the right stallion in the victory parade. After all, Zhukov had defied him during the war, and Stalin's own paranoia about military coups has always been clear, like when he persecuted Tukhachevsky. The Zhukov-Stalin dynamic is one of the more fascinating ones in this era. Like all the other great men surrounding Stalin, Zhukov learned how to read his capricious moods and react accordingly. But unlike Beria, whose response was usually to become more sycophantic and conform more closely to Stalin's views, Zhukov and Stalin had many arguments, and Stalin was often forced to back down. Beria and others would attempt to manipulate Stalin's own worldview by presenting them with information, but Zhukov was one of those who openly challenged it. So, what did this mean for them? Did this straightforwardness gain Stalin's respect? Did Stalin grudgingly acknowledge that if his generals had always been doormats, he would have made more mistakes? Historians have argued about Zhukov's genuine influence on the war, and his military strategies ever since. Some people accuse him of being very wasteful of human life, but regardless of the actual effectiveness, he was perceived by everyone, including Stalin, as the outstanding general of the war. Even after Zhukov's political downfall, Stalin did not have him executed, and refused to entertain the idea that he was really planning a coup, at least in private. He said, Zhukov's a straight-talking man, but he'd never go against the CC. But, the fact remained that Zhukov was immensely popular amongst the armed forces, and such people are always threats to autocrats. To make matters worse, Beria, who saw Zhukov as a threat to his succession, did everything he could to undermine him. There's a fascinating counterfactual that I can't resist going into here. Now, Zhukov never attempted a coup. In all likelihood, he didn't want to rule the USSR, but at the very least he didn't want to take the enormous gamble that an open power play against Stalin would entail. He was no politician. But his friendship with another Allied general, which developed at the conferences, has become notorious. Dwight Eisenhower, who would later of course be US President. Eisenhower always thought that Zhukov was too committed to Marxist ideals to portray the Communist Party. This may have been true, but he was also committed to peace between the two superpowers, and they exchanged friendly letters for years to come after the war. The two generals knew better than anyone else the hideous costs of war, and they were both focused on how they could maintain and establish peace. So if you're writing an alternative history novel, a premise where Zhukov seizes power in a coup, and détente between the USSR and the USA happens during the Eisenhower presidency in the 50s. It's a lot of fun. Maybe I'll get into it in a bonus episode for crazy counterfactual ramblings. Imagine being born in the late 1890s. Having endured two world wars and a Great Depression, you might just be looking forward to retirement when the atomic bomb was dropped in 1945. This, of course, was precisely what happened to Stalin. Stalin likely knew that the US had finished the atomic bomb before he was told, and certainly before it was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But it didn't change the fact that, for all the might of the Red Army, it meant that the balance of power had shifted back towards the capitalists. His reaction when Truman informed him at Potsdam belied his own annoyance that his scientists hadn't got there in time. He said, A new bomb, of extraordinary power, probably decisive on the Japanese. What luck! Stalin knew that the threat of nuclear war would prove a powerful bargaining chip. Of course, it was this that hung over the Cold War, and therefore most of geopolitics for the next 50 years. But it has to be remembered that during the Cold War, doctrines such as mutually assured destruction limited the impact that the threat of nuclear war could have diplomatically. But mutually assured destruction only works if the destruction is, well, mutually assured. As soon as the Soviets got the bomb, it would be apocalyptic for both parties to engage in a nuclear war, so it's not really a credible threat. Spheres of influence became the means by which the nuclear states could defend the interests of some of the non-nuclear states. But this equality was not the case in the few years after the Second World War, where the US had nuclear weapons and the Soviets did not. Stalin was not willing to be held over a barrel, and the Soviet efforts to develop their own bomb, which would have proved a useful tool in the Second World War, redoubled. The project was started in 1943, but progress was slow at first. It was an interesting side project for the Soviets. But now, in Stalin's view, as soon as the US dropped the bomb, it was completely necessary for them to maintain their power. 
As a physicist who knows a lot of physicists, the story of the bomb's development is a fascinating one for me. The stereotypes for physicists as socially awkward and mildly obsessive are not universally true, but they're true a statistically significant amount of the time. I've never fought in a war, and I can't even begin to truly empathise with the soldiers who did so, because it's so far from my realm of experience. To say that I can do is insulting to their memory. But a physicist, obliged to sit at a desk and calculate the most effective way to kill millions of people, as those who worked out the best way of conducting firebombing raids to produce terrible firestorms like the Allies caused in Dresden, Hamburg and Tokyo. There's just enough shared experience that it touches me all the more to imagine what that might be like, knowing that the intellectual problem you're solving would lead to unimaginable destruction. The Soviet physicists who developed the atomic bomb had to contend with more than their own moral scruples. Frustrated with the slow progress with Molotov supervising the bomb's development, Stalin put Beria in charge the day after Hiroshima. He said, Hiroshima has shaken the whole world. The balance has been destroyed and this cannot be. The appointment of Beria, who was a good organiser, but of course far more famous for his brutality, would send shivers down your spine as a physicist. You're a good worker, he'd say, but a spell in the gulag would make you even better. The scientists and technicians, tens of thousands of them working on the project, were essentially his prisoners. Beria knew that if the project failed, the next man to wake up in an anonymous NKVD dungeon would be him. Stalin was willing to provide them with all of the economic resources they could need, but time was not something he was willing to compromise on. The Soviet attempt to build the atomic bomb would be run just as all Soviet projects were, a dramatic, revolutionary struggle to hastily achieve the goal by any means necessary, with the threat of terror lurking in the background. It was a nuclear physics five years plan, but they didn't have five years. Many of the scientists who worked there were prisoners in Sharaska, which were the technical expert gulags where inmates were obliged to perform intellectual work. A lot of them had their work published anonymously or credited to more politically correct scientists. I can't imagine how much that would annoy a physicist. They were locked up behind barbed wire in secret cities. There were some brilliant physicists in the Soviet Union. Sakharov, Kapitsa, Kurkachev and Landau all worked on the bomb, and many of them did their work out of intellectual curiosity, a sense of duty, or even for the philosophical reason that a nuclear balance might actually prevent war. Yet, the physicists I know would have chafed under the rule of someone who knew nothing about physics, demanding unreasonable progress and making thinly veiled threats. This is another show that I'd like to do, is uh, just describing the development of the nuclear weapons by the uh, Soviet scientists under Beria. I think it's just such an amazing dynamic, and uh, if you're interested, I think I'll record an extra show on that. Stalin's attitude towards science was paradoxical at times. He understood the necessity of technical innovation to keep up with the West, and he was a strong supporter of scientific innovations, despite rarely understanding them himself. But at the same time, his politics was constantly in the picture. Scientists had been caught up in the Great Terror, along with the rest of the educational establishment. And after all, it makes sense, because they believe in an objective truth, independent of the party. Class issues came into play, as proletarian science was considered superior to bourgeois science. And science, of course, is just science. Ideally, it should be free from all political ideology. In some cases, the political influence was more direct. He championed the work of biologists who rejected natural selection and the theory of evolution. After all, its focus on the idea that the best traits were propagated by competition and survival of the fittest aren't very communist. Free market capitalism is pretty Darwinian. These interventions led to a persecution of geneticists in the USSR that did serious damage. In the case of physics, there was less scope for politically incorrect baryons and mesons, but politics was never absent. Stalin didn't want the scientists to be corrupted by outside influences. He championed theories developed by Russians and good communists especially sometimes without much consideration for their scientific merit. The uneasy tension between copying the more advanced Western nuclear program and pioneering Soviet science was never really resolved. Stalin's political considerations would come ahead of the reality. Scientists were useful tools, but he had little time for their explanations of why access to and building on Western research was crucial. Yet with the bomb, he deferred to their expertise often. Leave the physicists in peace, he'd say to Beria. They're doing their job. We can always shoot them later. <laughs>
Sakharov, who often clashed with Beria, later became an outspoken critic of the regime and a human rights activist. Other physicists, like Landau, were persecuted by the regime. He rejoiced when Stalin died, saying that he was no longer afraid of him and would no longer work on the bomb. This is a fascinating intersection between science and politics and the personal lives of the people concerned. Many of them got into science for idealistic reasons. Nuclear physics itself had then, and still has now, the potential secrets to unlocking vast sources of energy. How this energy is used is a human decision. They might have also thought that nuclear fusion was just a few decades away. They wanted to modernise the Soviet Union, as Stalin did, but with different methods and different motives. In the same way, the legacy of Soviet science, which brought a great many technological advances and had a great many fascinating but hidden figures, is complex. You can read what the scientists have to say about that work, and many of them report deeply mixed feelings. There was a community spirit. They were working on a fascinating and vital project that ended in world-changing success and rich financial reward, but they were threatened and deprived of their liberty. The heartlessness of the Soviet system and the expendability of its people was on display in the atomic programme too, but the physicists were protected by their intellects or how they were seen. The quiet efforts of the physicists, locked away in their secret city, would produce remarkable success. By 1949, they had detonated a nuclear bomb. The rest of the 20th century would unfold in the shadow of nuclear war. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email at us at autocracynowoutlook.com, follow us on Twitter, like our page on Facebook. Please, if you like us, rate us or review us on iTunes. That way I don't have to lock anyone in a secret city made of barbed wire and force them to listen to the podcast and review it, and it helps get us noticed. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, you can even donate to the show if you like. Next time, we will look at the shaping battle for Stalin's succession, and the increasing paranoia and mistrust he displayed in his declining years as well as the post-war settlement in Europe. Until then, be kind to one another. Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Today's episode is part of our series on Stalin, episode 12, The Red Tiberius and the Game of Thrones. Usually, when we're looking to make friends, we like people who are interesting or similar to us, but our favourite friends are the ones we can really relax around, where there's no pressure to perform or impress people, and you can just be yourself. In this sense, Stalin had very few friends. He had a sense of personal loyalty to many people. He even sent some of his old school friends from the gory spiritual seminary money in the post. But friendship doesn't seem like the ideal description. Could you be friends with someone anyway who had the power to kill you at any moment? Nearly everyone he associated with was a political associate, and after the Great Terror they were all terrified that he would turn on them and have them liquidated, as he had done with so many other old friends along the way. As Robert Service puts it, in the mid-1930s, he had turned to the families of his wives for company. But then he had killed or arrested several of them, and the survivors were in a state of psychological shock, not conducive to a dinner-party atmosphere. End quote. Of his surviving family, he had only ever really liked Svetlana, and their relationship had deteriorated as soon as she started dating. It was the resistance to his will that he disliked the most. Amongst the unsuitable candidates for marriage was Beria's son, who, perhaps uniquely among individuals, could understand what it was like to be the child of a murderous tyrant. Service even accounts a borderline upsetting incident in 1948, where he invited his surviving school friends from Gori to stay with him. 
Quite often, meeting old school friends you haven't seen in a while brings with it a certain kind of awkwardness. The affection's no longer present. Your lives have diverged since you first met, and you no longer have anything in common. What could Stalin, this man who straddled the world, have in common with anyone from Gori? And so, after a few days of awkward conversation and drinking, his school friends left early. So he was left with the Politburo. Imagine going on a night out with Stalin, after the war, after the terror. It's not such a ridiculous idea, because we have countless memoirs documenting Stalin's love of all-night alcoholic parties. They all describe how Stalin loved to stay up late at night, engaging in drinking games and watching movies. He would occasionally watch the Soviet-produced films, which always had a heavy element of propaganda, but personally preferred Western movies, although he usually kept them censored from the rest of the USSR, just as he had suppressed his beloved Dostoevsky. There's something you see, and it's not just Western cultural imperialism, but in all of the states of the USSR and East Germany and so on, there was a everyone had a penchant for the foreign films because they were still the best. He also temporarily banned scenes of kissing in films, which I actually kind of approve of. There is a paradoxical relationship in Soviet states to Hollywood films. They represent the worst of the bourgeoisie culture, and the hero is always terribly politically incorrect. You know, they're never on behalf of the state, it's always individuals. But they were a guilty political pleasure, and the few that made it through the censors always performed incredibly well at the box office. Stalin's love of westerns in particular, cowboy films, is well documented, and in some ways you can see why. Khrushchev reports that he'd watch them, condemn their ideology, and then order more. They might not have been properly Marxist, but they were closer to Stalin's own personality, the gruff outsider who returns to the community for revenge, following his own strict and sometimes mysterious moral code, capable of violence and cool under pressure. They are the American version of the Georgian Abrex that he so idolised. Koba, the literary hero that he'd named himself after, was not so far from John Wayne. John Wayne in particular was a figure of great concern. Stalin wanted him assassinated for his anti-communist views. Stalin also loved gangster movies, particularly those where the ruthless gang leader guns down his rivals. There's no doubt in my mind that he would have been a big Tarantino fan, and he probably would have loved The Godfather too. His sardonic, mocking side would come out during the scenes where a gang leader disposed of an underling who'd got too big for his boots, and the message was lost on no one. Khrushchev reports that he was, quote, reminding us that we were temporary people. He was not immune to the Russian tendency towards drink. I mean, vodka has its etymology in the Russian for water. Stalin never displayed any signs of being an alcoholic, however. Perhaps he remembered how it had destroyed his father and displayed better self-control. There was a competitive, even political element to these drinking sessions in more ways than one. As well as indulging in drinking games, Stalin liked to use alcohol as a tool of power. He would quite frequently pretend to be taking shots of vodka that was, in reality, water or wine. Being the only sober person in a crowd full of drunks is tedious. But you can learn things that way if you're willing to take advantage of loose tongues. Churchill and Stalin had engaged in an all-night drinking session in Moscow. Maybe he was trying the same trick, but Churchill was a notorious drinker, who was probably tipsy for most of the Second World War. Chances are Stalin wasn't able to drink him under the table. It's bizarre to imagine Stalin in the role of a boorish student, chastising all of his inner circle to drink until they were completely inebriated, and then vomit in the street but he had an eye for the information that could be gained. Maybe he also liked the humiliation that he could inflict on people. As Khrushchev said, when Stalin says dance, a wise man dances. Even in leisure, the threat from Stalin was always there for those closest to him. His inner circle were wary as they partied, and, you guessed it, Beria tried to cheat by drinking water, much to Stalin's annoyance. There's a brilliant chapter about Stalin's exploits in Montefiore, which you should read if you want to know just how studenty it really got. Put it this way, if there were traffic cones in Moscow, they would not have been left unmolested. But student hijinks were not the only games that were being played. The question of succession was starting to have an influence in politics. And Stalin knew this. Every one of his close political associates had their houses bugged. Presumably, the men who listened to their conversations, and might then know about them, were also bugged. 
Each of these potential successors was constantly waiting for opportunities to denounce and eliminate one another. The intrigue and conspiracies resembled nothing more than an imperial court. Stalin, of course, encouraged this, identifying the dividing lines in the Politburo and fueling the flames of adversity. As long as they were divided, they were less of a threat. As with a king, one man held absolute power, and swaying him was the means of becoming powerful in your own right. The courtiers must have had strange relationships with each other. Equally terrified of Stalin and his vengeance, sometimes even conspiring to conceal things from him, but also competing for influence when they weren't cooperating, when it suited them. If the wolf started devouring Politburo members again, any one of them could be next. They knew that a purge could be wide and sweeping and end up catching up people who weren't thought of as victims in the beginning. The dictator's tactic of constantly changing people's positions was utilised to maintain control. Key was to change your position on individuals constantly. Not enough to create chaos, but enough to be sure that everyone was uncertain and afraid about their own status. He'd hint at favouritism, and then denounce you the next day for some minor failing. Everyone knew the rules of the game, and the stakes. Beria, who had operated a few wiretaps in his time, knew that the best way to deal with them was a policy of carefully controlling what he said at home. He would criticise Stalin and the regime just enough to avoid arousing suspicion that he was hiding something, but not enough to have him done away with. Around this time, Stalin found a new favourite secret policeman, Abakumov. Abakumov enjoyed personally torturing his victims, and was appointed head of the MGB, that's the precursor to the KGB. The NKVD and the KGB operated side by side in a weird police state balance of power. Abakumov technically worked for Beria, but Beria must have known that he was looking at his own replacement, waiting in the wings if he went too far. After all, if you remember, that was how he got the job, and how the guy before him got the job. First to fall out of favour in the Soviet Game of Thrones was the Bolshevik who'd been with Stalin the longest, Molotov. In late 1945, he was temporarily in charge of the government, first among equals in a committee of four, as Stalin recuperated from his heart trouble. Molotov had his own agenda. He wanted rapprochement with the West, and as a precursor to this, he ordered Pravda to publish a speech of Churchill's that praised Stalin. Reading this from his Dhaka, Stalin was furious and sent an angry telegram. Molotov compounded his mistake by drunkenly suggesting, in a telephone call to Stalin, that the regime should be more liberal with the media. Western media began to speculate about Molotov succeeding Stalin. When Molotov read those articles, his blood must have run cold. That was not the kind of prophecy you wanted hanging over your head. That was the kind of prophecy that would get you torn down. After furiously denouncing Molotov's unilateral actions, which were really very minor actions, to the other members of the Politburo, Stalin had him temporarily demoted. A grovelling telegram from Molotov saw him saying that he valued the party's trust more than life itself. The rebuke was clear. Molotov would not succeed Stalin. With, with his position dented, he was re-promoted, but he'd fallen out of favour. Beria, in charge of the atomic bomb project, which he was now desperate to make a success, had lost control of most of the NKVD, and much of his authority had gone to Abakumov. Another scandal arose out of the war. Stalin became angry about how many Soviet planes had crashed, blaming saboteurs, wreckers, and incompetence in the production of the planes. This would later become the great aviator's trial. Stalin had Abakumov arrest and torture the Air Force commander, and he in turn implicated Melenkov, an ally of Beria's on the Politburo. He was demoted and exiled. Stalin was signalling his attentions to Beria very clearly. He even started attacking him and the NKVD for, get this, extracting false confessions from the people they had denounced. This, quote, criminal activity could not be tolerated, even though Stalin himself had ordered it. The irony was doubled when you consider that he had another branch of secret police under Abakumov torturing people to extract confessions to use against Beria. Not that any of Stalin's pretexts had ever really mattered to him. This was about power, pure and simple. Still, the political pressure might help explain why he was so mean to the physicists. As I mentioned last episode, Marshal Zhukov's prestige was of concern to Stalin. 
Zukov, who had no real desire to play politics, was also easily outmaneuvered. Mentioned increasingly less frequently by Stalin, Abakumov searched his home and discovered a rather large number of war trophies. Paintings, gold, shotguns, silk. And at the same time, the Air Force commander who was being arrested and tortured by Abakumov and now served as a sort of squeeze box for confessions, testified that Zhukov was taking credit for the Soviet victory and had openly criticised Stalin. Beria probably realised that he could please Stalin by wielding his little axe again, and he was key in instigating the investigations against Zhukov. He was apparently trying to remove him from power. The two definitely disliked each other. And it worked. The Politburo randed on Zhukov, accusing him of Bonapartism, trying to organise a military coup. Stalin didn't go this far. Zhukov was too popular and too well known to be disappeared in the same way as his enemies during the Great Terror. But Zhukov was demoted to a minor position in the Ural Mountains, and publicly disgraced. Marshal Kulik, the incompetent lover of cavalry, made some remarks on a bugged telephone line complaining about politicians stealing the credit from the generals, which is of course what Stalin had done. He was executed in 1950. And, you know, it's something of a miracle that Marshal Kulik, the bumbling fool, made it all the way to 1950, to be honest. But there were no show trials against the former military heroes. They were too well liked by the public. And Zhukov would return to politics after Stalin's death to exact his revenge on Beria. Marshal Zhukov's materialism was hardly uncommon. Not just among the soldiers, who engaged in widespread looting in retribution for the German looters, but also among Stalin's inner circle. Plenty of people have pointed out the ironies and hypocrisies in the Stalinist system. Just as they claim to be establishing socialism and economic equality, the higher echelons of the party lived in luxurious dakas, while often, for the people on the ground, there was not enough bread. They competed over who could have the finest and largest portrait of Stalin in their well-furnished offices. The intentional, pointed austerity of the early days of Bolshevism was gone, replaced by whatever luxuries the Soviet system could allow. But Stalin himself was never especially materialistic. He'd send a good deal of his money to friends and family, and aside from his general's uniform, his foreign films, and the occasional lavish banquet, he lived a fairly austere life. But those around him were more and more resembling the imperial court of the Tsar. Vasily Stalin, of course, has often been compared to the spoiled child of a Tsar, and the comparison bears some merit. He was still engaged in fearful drinking and partying. He even thought of himself, perhaps, as the heir to the throne, and he was scared of retribution from Stalin's underlings once Stalin died. His fears were justified, by the way. But the uneven spread of wealth was a means of control, with extra luxury and privilege reserved for party members, and a state command over the economy. You can reward people for their loyalty. And at the same time, there's an incentive for the brightest and best people to join the party. With Molotov out of favour, Zhukov shut down, and Beria under the watchful eye of Abakumov, no longer in control of the NKVD. Zdanov was Stalin's most likely successor. He, like Kirov, was in charge of the Leningrad party, and had also been placed in charge of cultural affairs, and he was the one who Stalin most frequently dropped his little hints about. Zdanov's cultural terror involved attacks on filmmakers, musicians, and the promotion of Russian nationalism. Perhaps the war made Stalin realise how useful this Russian nationalism was as a technique for maintaining control. It also came alongside a resurgent anti-Semitism. Stalin, before the war, did not have a long history as a particularly virulent anti-Semite. The Jews were persecuted under the Great Terror only insofar as every ethnic and religious minority was, because they might have had mixed loyalty towards the regime. But anti-Semitism was common in Russia, and it was used by the Tsars as a method of control. Anti-Jewish pogroms, or violent attacks on Jews, were common, and they'd been encouraged by the state as an outlet. After all, if they're blaming the Jews for their problems, they're not going to blame you. But there were Jewish members of the Politburo, and in the Communist Party. Stalin had publicly denounced anti-Semitism, which he viewed as against communist ideals, and punished with the death penalty. But at the same time, he'd flirted with it before, especially during his conflict with the Mensheviks, where they were more prominent. Essentially, before the war, 
Stalin had pursued anti-Semitic policies when it suited him. For example, in appeasing Hitler in 1939, he was almost certainly involved in the transfer of Jews. But he was not ideologically anti-Semitic during this time. But he became more and more so after the war. This was for a variety of reasons. Alongside the traditional perception of Jews as an internal enemy in a fifth column, a stateless people who owed no loyalty to the country. This portrayal naturally appealed to Stalin's paranoia, and after the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, his anti-Semitism hardened. Stalin had supported the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine, but only because he hoped that, due to the high number of Russian Jews, it would become a Soviet satellite state that would provide a base for communist power in the Middle East. It didn't work out this way, and the Israeli government came down firmly on the side of the USA in the Cold War. Russian Jews held a parade to welcome the ambassador to Israel in Moscow, and this display of what Stalin viewed as nationalism for a pro-Western country was the catalyst for a new, anti-Semitic purge that began in 1948. Museums and institutions were closed down. Stalin withdrew a lot of support for the Jewish culture that he'd given when he was angling for a pro-Soviet Israel, and eventually poets, cultural figures, and political allies who were Jewish were shot. By the end of 1952, Jews were being expelled from the government, and Stalin's rhetoric had become severe. He said, quote, Every Jewish nationalist is an agent of the American intelligence service. Jewish nationalists think that their nation was saved by the USA. They think that they're indebted to the Americans. Among doctors, there are many Jewish nationalists. End quote. His growing anti-Semitism was a sign of irrational paranoia, and the endless need to fight against some internal enemy, which we see throughout his reign. Note also his strange reference to the doctors. Stalin became convinced in the later years of his life that the doctors that he was treated by were attempting to kill him, and the fact that he conflates this with the Jewish threat starts to show you how you know, he's becoming more and more paranoid and irrational. Now, this need to fight against an internal enemy, it's beyond dealing with threats to his authority, and more the means by which that authority was always exercised. In the course of his anti-Semitic purges, he would denounce and arrest Molotov's wife, who was Jewish. He was further humiliated, as she endured imprisonment and lengthy denunciations from the prisoners that Abakamov was torturing. Moreover, he was forced to divorce her, and even vote for her expulsion from the party for being a Jewish nationalist. Eventually, she was sentenced to five years in the Gulag, though many thought that she was already dead. Imagine, then, being Molotov at a Politburo meeting, forced to sit and work with Stalin, who had denounced your wife and sent her off to some unknown fate. And all the while, Beria was there. He liked to taunt Molotov with the fact that he knew what had happened to his wife. He'd whisper, She's alive. Zanov's culture war, which included the persecution of musicians on political and cultural grounds, was not especially popular. Khrushchev didn't have much positive stuff to say about it. He said, I think Stalin's cultural policies, especially the cultural policies imposed on Leningrad through Zdanov, were cruel and senseless. You can't regulate the development of literature, art and culture with a stick or by barking orders. You can't lay down a furrow and then harness all your artists to make sure they don't deviate from the straight and narrow. If you try to control your artists too tightly, there will be no clashing of opinions, consequently no criticism, and consequently no truth. There will just be a gloomy stereotype, boring and useless. End quote. And so often it does seem like he's describing Soviet culture that way. The suppression of individuality was immense. Meanwhile, Zdanov, while still focusing on every aspect of the culture war, was dispatched to deal with a new threat. The Yugoslav Communist Parties had now been installed as the government of Yugoslavia under Marshal Tito. And this was one of the few places in the post-war settlement where the government was not a direct puppet communist party of Stalin's, but instead a homegrown communist organisation. So after the war, you know, in the settlement, Stalin had set up his own puppet communist parties and they'd taken over most of these eastern bloc states and ran them on the behalf of the USSR. Now, you might think that having the partisans in charge in Yugoslavia was good. After all, if a good number of people are genuinely sympathetic to communism in the country, and they have their own homegrown beloved leader to deal with, rather than some nobody who is obviously a puppet of Moscow, the regime is probably more stable, 
But Tito's own popularity and the fact that his Yugoslav partisans had liberated the country from the Nazis and not the Red Army meant that he had a greater independence, and Stalin could not tolerate this, especially when Yugoslavia began provocatively seizing territory and provoking the Western Allies. They intervened in the Greek Civil War on the Communist side, even though Stalin had promised Churchill in their naughty document that Greece was in the British sphere of influence. But more than any specific political annoyances that upset the Western Allies, Stalin was probably irritated that Tito continually defied his authority. A combination of Tito's nationalism and pride, and his eventual territorial ambitions, which probably involved setting up an independent Balkan bloc of communist countries outside of Stalin's control, all of these factors rendered him unacceptable to Stalin. He hoped that by withdrawing Soviet support from the Yugoslav communists, the regime would collapse. I'll shake my finger, and there'll be no more Tito, Stalin shouted. Zdanov was tasked with informing the Yugoslavians that they were no longer officially recognised by the USSR as a legitimate communist party, and made the ludicrous claim that Tito was an imperialist spy. But despite Stalin's attempts to shake his little finger and assassinate Tito, he would remain in place, which was something of an embarrassment to Stalinist supremacy. However, Stalin, again, certainly had a grudging respect for Tito, as he seemed to have for anyone who defied his authority. And here we return to one of the threads of our series, the third letter that was reportedly discovered in Stalin's desk. Alongside the note from Lenin denouncing him, and alongside the note from Bukharin begging for his life, the third note was from Tito. Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow, and I won't have to send a second. The model for communist strongmen had been made by Lenin and perfected by Stalin. It's interesting to see what happens when he faces off against someone, with the same purported ideology and similar tactics. The diplomatic efforts and probably the sheer stress of being one of Stalin's Politburo underlings took its toll on Zdanov, who was severely alcoholic. After a medical misdiagnosis, he suffered a series of heart attacks and died in 1948. Rumours that he was murdered by his doctors seem unrealistic. If Stalin wanted him murdered, he would have had him died in his sleep via poison, or else he would have just denounced and executed him as an example. Stalin always had an excuse prepared to denounce and destroy his underlings. He kept files on all of them. Not that he really needed to. If you're thinking that this constant juggling of underlings made enacting policy difficult, the answer is yes and no. There was a single party line that everyone conformed to on most matters. This was the stuff that was personally dictated by Stalin's. Individuals had a lot of free will to behave autonomously, but Stalin closely watched their actions and would pounce on anything he didn't like. The issue with Stalin's autocracy and the fear he created in the minds of his cabinet was less to do with the bureaucratic chaos as management changed, and more to do with the fact that everyone felt insecure in their position. That's ideal if you're a dictator who wants to maintain power over these people, but terrible if you want to change the system or reform it, because any faults or concerns that Stalin was not aware of, or didn't want to deal with, were very difficult to communicate to him. He couldn't micromanage everything, although he often tried but revealing flaws and failures left you open to denunciation by one of the other members of the Politburo. Stalin was not wholly ignorant, but his subordinates were incentivized by the terror to conceal information from him, and since he couldn't manage everything, this was bad for the state. Zdanov's death swung the power struggle back in favour of the other members of the Politburo once again. Beria and Melenkov came back into favour, Indeed, it was said that on the nights of Zadanov's death, every pub in Moscow was filled with Beria's associates drinking to the good news. The carousel of Stalin's associates and underlings wheeled around once again. Malenkov and Beria, temporarily back in favour with the boss, used their new position to, f to fuel Stalin's suspicions. Just as Kirov had used Leningrad as a separate power centre in 1934, might it not also be the case that Zdanov had done something similar? The city's military and industrial heroes were very popular locally, due to the fact that they'd helped Leningrad endure its brutal siege, and you can imagine that they might feel quite separate from the rest of the country after 900 days in the siege. The city had always been the ancient capital of Russia, and might prove a rallying point for resistance, 
In addition, the Leningrad wing of the party had always been a slightly separate power base to Moscow, pursuing different policies. This meant that often the man in charge of Leningrad had been a key ally of Stalin's like Kirov. The leading figures in the Leningrad party, like Voznesensky and Kuznetsov, were Politburo members or high-ranking MKVD officials. But Beria and Malenkov worked together, criticising the Leningrad party, which was full of Zdanov's old allies. They said that they were holding independent rallies, covering up scandals, and engaging in some vague conspiracy to split up the Soviet Union in favour of a Soviet Russia, with Leningrad as the new capital. Stalin barely needed any persuading to see conspiracies and enemies everywhere. He was not entirely disloyal to the memory of Zdanov, who had never entirely fallen out of favour, and he even encouraged Svetlana to marry Zdanov's son, which she did. Svetlana should really get a special episode all to herself, and maybe I'll do it one day. And please give me feedback about the special episodes that you'd like to hear. But familial ties aside, Zdanov's old political associates and comrades were doomed. Soon enough, the arrests of the Leningrad affair began. The two Politburo members were arrested and tortured by Abakamov, although notably they were told to leave Zdanov out of any testimony they'd give. I suppose that's just in case they implicated someone who was supposed to be innocent in Stalin's mind. This was his way. Write history according to whatever conspiracy theory you believe today, and implicate the people you've decided already are guilty. It was a mini-terror, and the first really violent purge of key political associates since the war. Kuznetsov had other ideas and refused to confess. I'm a Bolshevik and remain one in spite of the sentence I have received. History will justify us. His defiance is nicely recorded for the histories, but of course it made no difference, and both of the Leningraders were shot. Along with them, hundreds of associates and key members of the Leningrad elite were exiled to Siberia, deprived of their property, and removed from their positions of power and influence. Intellectuals and scientists were especially badly hit by the Leningrad purge, since the aim here was really to destroy the claim of the city to be a rival to Moscow on any level. The museum dedicated to the siege was closed. Having endured 900 days of torment, bombardment, starvation and unimaginable suffering, the city was further damaged and repressed by its own leader, just four years after the war ended. This nasty little political bloodbath had consolidated the power of Beria, Malenkov and Khrushchev, all of whom had signed the death warrants and were the last few in the clique who hadn't fallen from grace. There's some evidence that, when Stalin recalled Khrushchev from the Ukraine where he'd been ruling before the war, he did so in order for him to act as a counterbalance to the new bloc of Beria and Malenkov, who were rising again but instead they formed a loose but noticeable clique. But none of them could feel themselves safe. Stalin was ageing, ailing, in ill health, and directing more and more of the business of state via telegram from his Dhaka during lengthy holidays to recuperate. But he was as vicious as ever in persecuting anyone who seemed like they might be a threat. After the Leningrad affair, Abakumov fell from favour and was quickly liquidated himself, the latest in a long Stalinist tradition of secret policemen, who end up being shot by their own forces. If Stalin asks you to be the head of the NKVD, you should probably write your own will alongside the death lists. Given the rate at which he killed them, it's a miracle that none of them ever attempted a serious coup. These holidays are yet another strange scenario to imagine Stalin in. From the upstart revolutionary to the scheming party member, through the first among equals de facto ruler, via the orphanness of the Great Terror to dictatorial control, then we have the warlord bristling about Moscow, sleeping on a divan in the metro, or in his office and issuing volleys of orders, receiving constant reports. We have the triumphant hero, the global statesman, the master of Yalta, the saviour of the USSR. And now, we have the puttering old tyrant, alone in his dakas with his bodyguard. He'd entertain guests. In one instance, Svetlana came to stay. They had a fight when she wanted to return to Moscow, and eventually Stalin relented. Go if you want. I can't make you stay. But you aren't in a stranger's house. Later, in a letter to her, he would claimed that he wasn't lonely without her. Svetlana eventually defected to the USA, and described her father as a moral monster. But she never lost sight of the fact that her father showed more love to her than anyone else after Nadja died. Maybe anyone else in his life. For whatever reasons, she preferred to go along with the line that Stalin should not be held solely responsible, and her memoirs did shift a lot of the blame of the terror onto Beria and Yezov. But this was not an uncommon view in Russia at the time. 
Navigating your relationship with your parents can be difficult at the best of times. Svetlana would always be overshadowed by her father, a political prisoner of her name, as she said to herself. It is fair to say that they did not and could not have had a normal relationship. Stalin was just incapable of that. This is not a trait unique to tyrants, and nor is it a trait of all tyrants, but it was true of him. There was no way to break the cycle of mistrust and isolation. As he displayed signs of senility, as many old men do, he displayed signs of nostalgia, reminiscing to his bodyguards about Nadja, and even his first wife, Ketu. But the man who had spent so much time rewriting history and forcibly destroying the bonds of human affection found that he had no history and could find little affection in his old age. This was reflected by the memoirs of those around him, who generally described his physical and mental decline, saying that he was jittery in his old age and that he swung to extremes. Stalin was even more damned by Khrushchev after Stalin's death. He essentially dismissed him as senile and paranoid towards the end of his life. Stalin would get no comfort from those he terrified. Instead, as ever, he focused on politics and the international situation. The post-war settlement in Europe had left Germany occupied by the British, Americans and Russians, divided up into four sectors, and they each had half of the capital, Berlin. When the US voted for the Marshall Plan, providing financial aid to countries that had been damaged by the war, and they started to introduce a new currency to their half of Germany and Berlin, Stalin felt that he was being economically undermined. Indeed, the citizens of Berlin began changing their currency into the Western Deutschmark. Stalin imposed the Berlin blockade in 1948, hoping to force the Western Allies to abandon their half of Berlin. The whole city was deep in Soviet territory. The Allies got around it via a massive airlift of supplies to the encircled city. It was one of the first bluffs and counterbluffs of the Cold War. The Red Army massively outnumbered the US and British forces in the city, and their air force could easily have stopped the airlift, but neither side was willing to open hostilities on a Third World War. Tensions were high in the city itself. There was a near riot when the communists attempted to take over the municipal government. This would, of course, just be the start for the suffering of Berlin, a city that would be divided for another 40 years. After months of blockade and resupply, the Soviets backed down in May 1949 and lifted the blockade. Stalin had been tested and beaten, but the standoff continued. In 1949, the Allies created the Federal Republic of Germany, which late West Germany it would later be known, and a month later Stalin and the Kremlin would create East Germany in response. If you want to look at things through a Marxist viewpoint, this era after the war, and using the war as an excuse, was about him establishing communist countries in as many nations as possible. Yet it's also clear that his idea of communism meant strict hegemonic control from Moscow, once socialism was established, national borders and divides were just supposed to melt away. The only true divide, after all, was meant to be that between the working class and the bourgeoisie. But of course, in practice, this didn't happen. Stalin was as frustrated by the other communist movements that weren't directly under his control, as he was by the Western Allies, as shown by the way he continually tried to have Tito assassinated. In 1949, the leader of the Communist Party in China, Chairman Mao, took over, and was originally deferential to Stalin. He said, quote, Stalin is the leader of the world revolution. This is of paramount importance. It is a great event that mankind is blessed with Stalin. Since we have him, things can go well. As you know, Marx is dead and so are Engels and Lenin. Had there been no Stalin, who would there be to give directions? But having him, this really is a blessing. Now there exists in the world a Soviet Union, a Communist Party, and also a Stalin. Thus the affairs of the world can go well. But of course, Mao was saying this when his armies still needed Soviet financial and military support, so you have to take this deference with a grain of salt. They met for the first time in 1949, but of course there was little comradely cheer to go around. Mao was put up in a minor hotel rather than Stalin's Dhaka, as Churchill had been. He described trying to extract aid from the Soviets as like taking meat from the mouth of a tiger. Enraged when Stalin stalled in meeting him, he yelled at the walls of his apartment, which he knew had been booked. I am here to do more than eat and shit. They may have shared an ideology, but, in many ways, like religious extremists, they found minor points of the doctrine to fight about, to conceal the rivalries and suspicions. Stalin was suspicious that Mao was not a true urban revolutionary, but instead focused on the peasants. Again, Marxism's inability to deal with them would come up. 
They could have negotiated a Sino-Soviet treaty that would have coordinated their efforts and frustrated the West, but instead there were long silences and mutual suspicions and hostility. It is one of the great questions of history. If the communist movement had remained unified and there was no split between the Soviets and the Chinese, would things have turned out differently in the Cold War? As it was, the two leaders would continually eye each other with a deep suspicion. Things were immediately tested when the communist leader of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, asked for permission to invade the South. The peninsula had been divided in the Soviet invasion of the Japanese territory at the end of the war. Stalin demurred, asking Mao and the Koreans to come to an agreement together. In 1950 they invaded and the Korean War began. Like many conflicts that pitted non-communists against communists, the whole affair quickly became a proxy war, just like Vietnam and the Spanish Civil War before it, between the two ideologies. Stalin was boycotting the UN, and so he didn't use the veto when they intervened, and with Stalin's blessing, a proxy war between the US and communist China began. Stalin was unwilling to get bogged down in a conflict on the Korean peninsula, but he used his influence to encourage Mao to do so. He was probably hoping for a quick war that would be over before it had the chance to begin. No escalation into a third world war which every conflict now had the potential to become. Which begs the question of why he didn't support the North Koreans more. They were armed and equipped later on, but after the US intervention it meant that the war would necessarily drag on and end in a stalemate. Stalin's policy was muddled, almost intervening but not quite, and it ended badly for the Soviets and escalated tensions with the West. A lot of blood was lost and very little changed. And of course we're still living with the ramifications of that settlement today. With Stalin frail and beginning to make increasingly dubious decisions on policy, we'll leave it here for this episode. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. You can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter, like our page on Facebook. Please leave a rating and review on iTunes, which helps to get us noticed. Uh, leave ratings and reviews on your favourite podcatcher anywhere. That way I don't have to play the podcast through massive speakers smuggled onto public transport and then leave sheepishly at the next stop. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. Next time we will, finally, see the end of Stalin. One last paranoid plot against his allies and associates would be foiled only by his death. I'm then going to quickly deal with what happened after his death, and that most complex of questions. Stalin transformed and terrorised the Soviet Union. His was a reign of endless conflict, against internal enemies, real or imagined, against non-communist ideologies, against Russia's backwardness, against the Nazis, against the West, and against his own paranoia. Did he win? What was Stalin's legacy? Until then, be kind to each other. Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. This week it's episode 13, the last in our series on Stalin. It's called Fall of the Tsar, Death and Legacy. In 1951, Stalin was 73 and in declining health. His physical and mental faculties were starting to decline, but his keen sense of paranoia did not. When a secret policeman, deputy head of the MGB, called Ryumin, sent him a letter, detailing a wild conspiracy theory that Jewish doctors had been responsible for the murder of lead Soviet officials. It was music to Stalin's ears. Here was a new chance to combine his growing anti-Semitism, his mistrust of doctors, and his fears over his own ailing health into a new purge project. It was time, thought Stalin, for another purge. Ryuman's letter was encouraged by some members of the Politburo, like Malenkov. In unleashing another wave of political violence, though, they were playing with fire. 
there is evidence that Stalin felt that this, the doctor's plot, was a good excuse to turn on all of his old associates. The plot started with doctors, but there was no way that Stalin wanted it to end there. Rather than a specific conspiracy among doctors to assassinate Bolshevik leaders, he wanted to expand the inquiry, to unearth a vast conspiracy, a US-backed spy network linked to the Zionists of Israel, that had nothing in mind other than the complete destruction of the Soviet state. His attitude towards his Politburo members while he was engineering the doctor's plot was a mix of suspicion and pity. He said, quote, You are blind like young kittens. What will happen without me? The country will perish because you do not know how to recognise enemies. His behaviour became increasingly ominous, constantly grumbling, forgetting the names of his closest comrades, and muttering about how the Politburo was too old. We must be replaced by younger bodies, he said at one point. His behaviour was enough to cause considerable alarm amongst his inner circle. In a bizarre episode, he lashed out at his bodyguard and threatened to put him on trial for a conspiracy and sack the Soviet minister for trade. This imagined conspiracy was about some unripe bananas that he'd been served a few days ago. The minister for trade must have been baffled by his sudden dismissal. It was only the quiet dismissal and the lack of action on the part of the Politburo that stopped the banana plot from escalating. But any sign of instability in Stalin could have been exploited by these men to fight their own political battles. The same bodyguard who had served Stalin for decades was sacked for, bizarrely, encouraging his son Vasily's alcoholism. He persecuted Beria's friends and was probably planning his eventual political destruction, biding his time until he could implicate Beria. For his part, Beria was getting more and more ambitious, and more and more impatient for Stalin himself to die. He had plans for reform of the Soviet Union after Stalin's death, and even considered that private property should be restored. As well as a sick, sadistic, torturing rapist with skeletons in his basement, he was an intellectual with a coherent political plan for the party, and his contempt for Stalin was increasing by the day. His son wrote that he viewed Stalin as less than human. It was not long before ridiculous allegations were going around that Beria was secretly Jewish. His enemies in the Politburo and in the Soviet system were attempting to manipulate Stalin into one last flailing attack against his closest political associates. He had his doctors and other prominent Jewish people arrested and ordered his new favourite secret policemen to torture them. Beat, beat and beat again. Put them in chains, grind them into powder. This was his preferred tactic for the investigations. The anti-Semitism, which was still officially denounced, was increasing. Stalin insisted that Russian writers should have their Semitic names published in brackets next to their Russian pseudonyms. Does this sound familiar? There are allegations, although not much concrete evidence, that Stalin was planning a massive purge of Jews from the USSR. There was a letter that the magnates around Stalin said was going to order compulsory eviction of the Jews. Ominously, it was recently discovered that two new gulags were being built in the early 1950s. You wouldn't put it past him, would you? The more vulnerable Stalin feels, the more he lashed out. It had always been this way, and his declining health was the final vulnerability of his life. And this, this is the pain and the suffering that an autocrat can cause, when tiny things like a banana that's unripe being served to you can lead to massive consequences for the state. Because... When the state reflects a person so completely, when that person becomes unstable, what does it mean for the state? At the party congress towards the end of 1952, he rounded on Molotov and Mikoyan, long-standing old Bolsheviks who'd been Politburo members for decades. He denounced them, implying that they were involved in Zionist plotting and casting aspersions on Molotov for his Jewish wife. They were removed from the new instrument of government that Stalin was setting up and banned from attending his parties. If Berry and the others felt any satisfaction at the destruction of some more of their rivals, it didn't last long. Stalin was escalating his purge, and they were all convinced that he meant to have them not only removed from power, but arrested, tortured, and killed. After all, they'd spent the last 20 years watching Stalin deal with all his perceived problems this way. They knew that status, loyalty, and friendship would not necessarily protect you. Just look at Kirov. There is some evidence that Beria, Khrushchev, Molotov, and Mikoyan defended each other against the wrath of the ageing Stalin. Unlike in previous purges, they all refused to denounce the others, an act of apparent loyalty that probably had more to do with the terror of an irrational, ageing Stalin with violent mood swings. 
than any genuine friendship between the men. The rumbling doctor's plot was signified at the start of 1953 with another hysterical article in Pravda. Quote, Investigation established that participants in the terrorist group, exploiting their positions as doctors and abusing the trust of their patients, deliberately and viciously undermine their patients' health by making incorrect diagnoses and then killed them with bad and incorrect treatments. Covering themselves with the noble and merciful calling of physicians, men of science, these fiends and killers dishonoured the holy banner of science. Having taken the path of monstrous crimes, they defiled the honour of scientists. Among the victims of this band of inhuman beasts were comrades Zdanov and Sherbakov. The majority of participants of the terrorist group were bought by American intelligence. They were recruited by a branch office of American intelligence, the international Jewish bourgeois nationalist organisation called Joint. The filthy face of this Zionist spy organisation, covering up their vicious actions under the mask of charity, is now completely revealed. Other participants were long-time agents of English intelligence, serving it for many years, carrying out its most criminal and sordid tasks. The bigwigs of the USA and their English junior partners know that to achieve domination over other nations by peaceful means is impossible. Feverishly preparing for a new world war, they energetically send spies inside the USSR and the people's democratic countries. They attempt to accomplish what the Hitlerites could not do, to create in the USSR their own subversive fifth column. End quote. This hysteria and this bizarre conspiracy theory had Jewish people in the Soviet Union and Stalin's inner circle terrified. The escalating rhetoric against Jewish people the elevation of conspiracy theories to the top branch of government and the escalating rhetoric against the USA was a clear provocation. Would they intervene? There were those around Stalin convinced that he was hoping to trigger World War III. Now this strikes me as unlikely, but his motives are often unreadable. The old man was clearly planning something, and he remained utterly and ruthlessly control of the state apparatus of terror that had kept him in power. The four Politburo members even considered assassinating Stalin, but they quickly dismissed the idea. The issue is one of trust. They all knew that after Stalin died there would be a power struggle. If they conspired in his murder, it would become a tool of that power struggle, and they may have all ended up dead. Or, as Mikoyan put it, we were afraid that the people would not understand. Early one Sunday morning, in March 1953, after a long drinking session with his political associates, who were, by now, his only friends, tipsy and cheerful, Stalin dismissed the Politburo and his bodyguards. Unusually, he ordered them not to call and check on him, but maybe he was just concerned about a brewing hangover. The next day, Stalin was late to appear. The anxious bodyguards waited for hours. His schedule was usually regular, albeit completely nocturnal. A light was switched on in the Dakar, and they assumed that he would be emerging soon. But he didn't arrive. Eventually, a package arrived for Stalin, and the guards were forced to make a decision. Risk his wrath for disturbing him, or risk his wrath for failing to deliver his mail? When you're dealing with a man who threatens treason trials over unripe bananas, even the little decisions become paralysed by terror. Eventually, one of them plucked up the courage to see the leader. He was discovered, collapsed on the floor, drenched in his own urine. His watch had stopped when he hit the ground, six hours before, and he was only able to emit a low, buzzing noise instead of speech. Stalin had had a massive stroke, and had probably fallen over the moment he turned on the light in the Dakar. The events that followed, more than anything else, indicate just how much Stalin had impressed himself on the mind of the nation, and on the people who surrounded him. The response was immediate panic, crippling fear. The bodyguards knew that Stalin was not yet dead, and he was orchestrating a plot against killer doctors. If they summoned doctors, and Stalin recovered... They could be implicated in the plot and shot. But if they failed to fetch medical attention, and Stalin recovered, surely he'd have them killed for sabotaging his health. Just like the days after Barbarossa, a sense of mad panic was in the air. Everyone wanted to shift the responsibility onto someone else. Everyone was scared of Stalin's reaction. This, in microcosm, was the fatal flaw of the Soviet Union under Stalin. He created this atmosphere of terror that meant that reform, Meaningful action was impossible without his say-so, and everyone was hampered by considering how he, personally, would react. The next few days are somewhat murky historically. Everyone had their own motivations in the issue of succession, 
to talk about these next few days. Robert Service describes them as clear as tar. Different individuals, it seems, remember things differently for their own political reasons. What does seem clear is that the bodyguards, hoping to absolve responsibility, summoned the Politburo members. Then there was a vigil for a number of days over Stalin's prone body. Everyone was transfixed by his condition. His underlings, Beria especially, were certainly planning their coups and how they would seize power. Yet none of them could act while Stalin still lived, with the remote possibility that he might recover. He could no longer speak, just like Lenin in his final days. But a word from him, if he could say it, would still mean death. None of them called a doctor for the first twelve hours after the stroke. While they all clearly had an incentive to leave Stalin to die, after all, if he recovered, what happened wasn't going to be pretty, I don't think it amounts to negligent murder. Stalin's own doctor was currently being tortured in secret police dungeons. The decision to call one could easily have backfired, and that, as much as anything, was probably why they didn't do it. At any rate, medically speaking, it probably wouldn't have helped. A brain operation might have saved Stalin's life, but you can hardly imagine anyone feeling they had the authority to let that happen. Also, if I was a doctor, I'd be really reluctant to operate on Stalin. If he died, there would surely be consequences. Beria, who feared for his own life after the persecution of his friends and allies, was key to this delay. He'd later boast, quote, I did him in! I saved you all! This was probably not literal, implying that he murdered Stalin, although he did like his poison, but instead a reference to the delayed treatment. There are, of course, conspiracy theories that Beria drugged Stalin and had him assassinated. With no evidence, it's hard to come to any conclusion either way. I lean towards thinking it was natural causes for a number of reasons. Stalin was old, he was an alcoholic, he was in declining health. And the timeline for Beria drugging Stalin doesn't hang together particularly well. You also have to remember that everyone was in total awe of Stalin. He'd become the godlike figure who dictated everything to them. Their paralysis during his final illness was as much to do with the fact that they'd never done anything without consulting him for decades. They owed their lives to him, they owed their careers to him, and even though he'd declined in recent years to many of the Politburo, he was still the omnipotent intellectual who had dragged the country through the five-year plans, the terror, and the war. If you'd lived your life and political career, the last thirty years in constant fear of such a man, seeing him almost every day, knowing that he could order your death at the drop of a hat, seeing the people he'd had killed, being forced to gauge his moods and respond accordingly, would you really put it past him to spring from his apparent deathbed and denounce everyone who was there as enemies and spies? Also, strong evidence against this conspiracy theory is the fact that Beria wasn't in an especially strong position, as shown by what happened after Stalin's death. So if it was an assassination, he didn't think it through. The doctors, who were being tortured in the grim cellars of the Lubyanka prison, were suddenly being asked a rather different set of questions by their persecutors. Instead of being ordered to implicate themselves in a vast Jewish conspiracy, the doctors were suddenly being asked about a hypothetical patient. If he exhibits chain Stokes respiration, what does this mean for the prognosis? The confused doctors replied that this would be a most serious symptom indeed. The prognosis was grim for Stalin. Svetlana and the other party bosses were summoned to his deathbed. The drunken Vasily yelled at everyone for failing to save him, probably already afraid of their retribution. Beria, according to sources that are probably quite biased, oscillated between denouncing Stalin's prone body and then returning to kiss his hand and display subservience whenever it looked like Stalin was about to wake up. Doctors were eventually summoned and, with trembling hands, examined the patient. They would later say in memoirs that they too were all convinced that they were going to be killed. For five days, this scene dragged out. Svetlana, who loved her father more tenderly than she ever had before, a staggering Vasily, a scheming, denouncing, amped-up barrier, and the others, who had served Stalin for so long and felt such a strange mixture of relief and sadness that they all reported. They were observing the death of a vast titan of history, and a vast titan in their own lives. The significance of the occasion was lost on no one. Many of them openly wept. On the morning of the 5th of March, 1953, Stalin breathed his last. Svetlana, his only daughter, described it in her book. At the last minute he opened his eyes. It was a terrible look, either mad or angry, and full of the fear of death. 
His hand rose. He seemed to be pointing upwards or threatening us all. Then with one last effort, his spirit tore itself from his body. We all stood frozen and silent. Then the hand fell back down. The king was dead. Beria leapt to be the first to kiss that cold, dead hand. Then he sped off to shred some incriminating documents in the Kremlin, although he was unable to save his own historical reputation, as you can probably tell by the way I've described him so far. The others lined up to pay their respects to his body. Even those who had been immediately scheduled for liquidation wept at the death of their ruler. He left a huge vacuum in their lives and at the head of the Soviet superstate and world communism. He also left behind a power struggle and a complex legacy. His body was embalmed and his death was announced to a shocked Soviet state the following day. The people had not been told about his ailing health, and so the death came as a surprise. It was akin to their JFK moment, but arguably more cataclysmic. Everyone remembered where they were when they heard the news. His body was displayed in Red Square in Moscow, alongside Lenin, and the crowds that flocked to see it soon became so large that the event was a human crush disaster, Thousands of people were injured, and it's probable that hundreds died in the crush, although the newspapers and authorities covered up the full extent of the damage, and merely reported obituaries of Stalin. Even from beyond the grave, he was causing death and suffering to the Russian people. I'll talk about the power struggle to succeed Stalin first, and tie up the loose ends before trying to assess his legacy. Stalin's official positions, which had been numerous but never really the point of his power, were divided up between the Politburo members. It was Beria who took the initiative on Stalin's death, racing to the Kremlin and taking charge. Immediately he began a whirlwind of reforms. Backed up by Malenkov, he released over a million political prisoners from the Gulag, cancelled the purge of the doctor's plot, and was beginning to show signs of liberalising the Soviet hold over the satellite nations in the Baltic and in East Germany. It's hard to know what Beria's plans were for the regime, he held Stalin and his policies in contempt, and was clearly itching to shape things in his own way. Maybe he was planning a detente with the West, but he was a brutal killer, and a personally very unpleasant man. The other members of the Politburo doubtless despised him, and an attempted uprising in East Germany convinced many who were sitting on the fence that he was a threat to Soviet power and hegemony over the communist states. Khrushchev began approaching other members of the Politburo, and, likely as much out of fear for their own skins if Beria turned on them, they all, including Malenkov, agreed to denounce him. Khrushchev also approached Marshal Zhukov in his exile in the Ural Mountains. He agreed to be the muscle behind their coup, probably very keen to avenge himself on Beria, who'd been keen getting him demoted in the first place. In a meeting on the 26th of June, Khrushchev ambushed Beria in a very Stalinist way, accusing him of being a British spy and a traitor to the Soviet Union. Beria, perhaps arrogantly, didn't realise that this meeting was his downfall. When a signal was given, Marshal Zhukov arrived and gleefully arrested Beria. He suffered the fate of so many Soviet politicians before him, the fate that he dished out to so many. In a secret trial, he was accused of treason, terrorism, and counter-revolutionary activities. There is no small amount of poetic justice in the way Beria fell. It was the same way he had destroyed many of his own political rivals. He begged to be allowed to live, but his executioners stuffed a rag into his mouth to shut him up and he was shot and buried anonymously in a forest, as so many of his victims had been. Although all the members of the Politburo signed death warrants and engaged in a vicious purging of Stalin's foes, and it's unfair to pin everything on Beria, as Stalin apologists often do, he was a personally vile man and has been rightly reviled by history. Khrushchev emerged as the dominant leader, and for a few years there was semi-stability at the top of the Soviet order. In 1956, though, Khrushchev pivoted, delivering the infamous secret speech on the cult of personality and its consequences. Here, to the shock of everyone, he denounced Stalinist crimes. Quote, After Stalin's death, the Central Committee began to implement a policy of explaining concisely and consistently that is impermissible and foreign to the spirit of Marxism-Leninism to elevate one person, to transform him into a superman possessing supernatural characteristics, akin to those of a god. Such a man supposedly knows everything, sees everything, thinks for everyone, can do anything, is infallible in his behaviour. Such a belief about a man, and specifically about Stalin, was cultivated amongst us for many years. 
end quote. He reminded everyone that Marxism had no room for individual dictators, implying that Stalin had betrayed Marxism. Lenin was still held in high regard as a glorious leader, but Khrushchev was set on reshaping history. Lenin's testament, the damning passage that described Stalin as rude and said he should have been replaced, it had been suppressed for more than 30 years, but it was read out by Khrushchev to the gathered communists. He then went on to denounce Stalin's capricious and despotic character. And although he was careful to insist that Trotsky, Bukharin and Stalin's other enemies had been wrong about communism, he denounced their liquidation and Stalin's use of torture to extract confessions from so-called enemies of the people. To considerable indignation, he described the extent of how the terror had affected the Communist Party, how many of the members of the Party Congress had voted against Stalin and been shot, and how the security service had fabricated the cases against them, with specific examples. Khrushchev left an awful lot out. For example, the fact that he, and all the other members of the Politburo except for Stalin and Beria, were complicit. He never mentioned that their involvement in the treason trials. He told the delegates how they had been bugged and were fearful that Stalin would have them killed, but their own role in encouraging purges and using them to dispatch of political enemies was conveniently ignored. But it is amazing to think how daring Khrushchev often was in his criticism of Stalin. Quote, you see what Stalin's mania for greatness led to. He completely lost consciousness of reality. He demonstrated his suspicion and haughtiness not only in relation to the individuals in the USSR, but in relation to whole parties and nations. End quote. You can read the whole speech online if you Google Khrushchev's secret speech, and it's a really fascinating read. You can even see what the reactions were of the people in the room, because it's all part of the transcript. We're watching the careful manipulation of history for Khrushchev's own political ends. Selective disclosure of what had gone on during Stalin's treason trials. Acknowledgement of the Great Terror, to an extent. And yet most of what he said has been substantiated as true as the Soviet archives have been opened up. Everyone in the USSR knew that Stalin had repressed and purged people. The evidence had been there in the disappearing party and political figures, and there's no way you could conceal the mass arrests of 1937. But it had rarely been discussed openly for fear of reprisals until now. The secret speech which was soon widely published was a comprehensive denunciation of Stalin and Stalinism a tumultuous event in Soviet history. Khrushchev had numerous motivations for being the one to denounce Stalin's crimes. A desire to see the truth exposed and to rehabilitate old friends, as well as revenge himself on the legacy of the man he'd lived in fear from for so long. But also there were many political reasons. It bolstered his own legitimacy to expose this last great conspiracy. And he hoped that by removing the fear of repression and political murder from the USSR, the party might be more efficient and he might be less at risk from political murder. But it was also key to maintaining the structure of the state. Throughout the speech, Khrushchev praises Lenin and Marxism, and reaffirms his commitment and the USSR's commitment to its founding philosophy. He was portraying Stalin as a dangerous deviation from that philosophy, and blaming him for the failures of the state. This allowed the communist regime to be prolonged. De-Stalinization helped in some of Khrushchev's reforms. The gulags were eventually closed. References to Stalin were removed from public buildings, and the national anthem. The Soviet Union was moving forward, or so at least its leadership claimed. It also undermined his rivals in the Politburo. Condemning the terror made it possible for Khrushchev to imply that anyone who opposed him was advocating a return to Stalinism. He owned the denunciation of Stalin, and subtly presented himself as the way forward, rather than a reversion back to the bad old days. His Politburo rivals tried to depose him in 1957, but eventually Molotov, Malenkov and Kaganovich were sacked after they bitterly disputed over who'd been the most guilty in Stalinist crimes and death lists. But the days of mass political murder in the Soviet Union, I mean Stalin would have purged these rivals, the days of mass political murder in the Soviet Union were done. They retired, they wrote their memoirs and they died. At the same time, the secret speech created riots and unrest in Hungary and Eastern Europe who perhaps hoped that this would this liberalisation would allow these states to be freed. Khrushchev himself was overthrown in 1964 after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and also retired, writing his memoirs and dying in 1971. He would also eventually admit to being up to my elbows, quote, in the blood of his victims. After a long break from Russia, I might one day try and deal with his fascinating attempts to reform and preserve the Soviet system. <laughs> 
Vasily Stalin was right to be afraid of the Stalinist Politburo. He was arrested shortly after Stalin's death for getting drunk and discussing state secrets with Western diplomats, which, in fairness, doesn't sound all that ridiculous. He was eventually released from prison under de-Stalinisation, but he died in 1961 due to his alcoholism. His is a tragic tale with little to redeem it. Svetlana defected to the West in 1961 and lived a tumultuous but fascinating life. She got married numerous times and wrote books about her experiences. She returned to Russia, left again, and lived in England and the United States under the name Lana Peters for many years. She died in 2011. Her children, Stalin's grandchildren, are still alive and living in the US and Russia. She was never able to escape from the shadow of her father, and this was a constant frustration for her. It could also be said for the nation as a whole. So what of Stalin's legacy? For someone with such immense political power, the man of steel with a superpower state and a legion of killers at his disposal, and for someone who had ordered the deaths of so many, Stalin's life seems dominated by fear. Hitler might have been driven by hate and a twisted ideology about the future of the world, but you never get the sense that Stalin was in the same way. In a less guarded moment, he confessed to Zhukov, I'm a most unfortunate person afraid of my own shadow. It was necessary for him to not only remove his political rivals from power, but later to have them humiliated and killed. In the case of the highly suspicious death of Kirov, suspicions likely led him to eliminate one of his closest friends. While he certainly didn't believe that everyone who was invested in the Great Terror was part of a real, vast, Trotskyite conspiracy theory, he was afraid enough for his own position, and ruthless enough, that he felt it necessary to liquidate thousands of innocent people. Before the war, he was in utter denial about the threat of Nazi invasion. His fear did not serve him well then. When it occurred, he had a nervous breakdown. After the war, in his declining years, his paranoia only increased. At the end of his life, he was an irrational maniac, persecuting his own doctors, obsessed with the idea they were going to kill him. It would be tragic if he didn't also have the power to destroy them. And the amount that he'd intimidated his Politburo probably led to his own death in the sense that he couldn't get the medical care he needed. Even in Stalin's politics, the fear has a firm hold. Anything that was suboptimal, anything that went wrong in his meticulously drafted micromanaged plans, was the inevitable consequence of wreckers and saboteurs. Instead of the state driven by the idealism of communism, instead of being a fanatical communist, he believed in fear, both as a weapon of control and as a motivating factor in his life. If the emotion that dominated Stalin's psyche was monotonic, then his response to any problem was nearly as constant. Here, the gaps and confusions of Marx and the brash authoritarianism of Lenin have their own contributions to make. But Stalin's preferred solution to any problem was a struggle as vast and titanic in scale as the nation he ran, even when this was far from the most efficient way of running things. I always used to compare my own style in answering exam questions to the five-year plan, set ridiculous targets for the number of words you produce, and over-fulfill them through ridiculous effort, even if the quality was lacking. It worked too, but maybe because people didn't want to read my handwriting. Economic, industrial, agricultural development, the war effort, the conquest of internal enemies, the cultural and social changes that would lead to socialism, or at least to Stalin remaining in power. All of these disparate and complex problems were attacked with an emphasis on might, brute force, and massive struggle. Stalin was not a total ideologue. He was pragmatic and capable of compromise on numerous occasions, strategically withdrawing from his positions when it suited him, and when it was necessary to remain in power. This explains why he was capable of remaining in charge for so long. But the withdrawals were only ever temporary substitutes for his preferred method of autocracy, a constant, never-ending revolutionary struggle. This was what he had grown up into, and what the ideology of Lenin had frozen into, and he maintained it until the end. The frozen, rigid, locked-in nature of the system made reforming it almost impossible. There were areas of ruthless efficiency, industrialization, creating the war machine, but there were also areas where the slavish devotion to the party, and Stalin in particular, rendered everything inefficient. You think of useless steel piling up in warehouses, competent workers and managers arrested or killed. With no opposition, and completely hostile to criticism of its rigid ideology and policies, the Stalinist system was as inflexible a government as the old Tsarist regime that couldn't accept the necessity for democracy and reform. The USSR attained military supremacy with the Red Army, 
and managed to catch up even with the US in developing nuclear weapons. The threat of force rendered it a superpower. But true socialism was never even close to being established. Stalin would insist in later years on his motto, Life is getting better, comrades. Life is getting merrier. But so much of the Soviet economic development was concentrated on the military. Collectivization didn't even begin to solve the agricultural problems that plagued the Soviet Union, and it caused mass casualties in the countryside. The quality of life for most people stayed the same or became worse under Stalin, as the rest of the world developed. And on this level, the communist states rarely came close to competing with the West, as big a reason as any for the collapse of their support when the Soviet Union fell apart. Economic inequality, social problems, widespread corruption, they were huge problems in the Soviet system, and it was completely incapable of reform. When Gorbachev tried, the whole state collapsed. This is as much to do with the concentration of power as anything else. The USSR had been established as a socialist paradise. Stalin had run it as a tyrannical dictatorship. It ended up being as far from Marx's dream as most regimes. Stalin sowed the seeds of the Sino-Soviet split that would eventually undermine the influence of the USSR. Communist parties in other nations like Yugoslavia were beginning to show signs of disloyalty and chafing under the hegemony of Moscow. Stalin's early policies modernised the nation in a lot of ways. Education was free and widespread, and Russian literacy rates shot up. But it was also shot through with propaganda, and liberal free expression was as tightly controlled as it ever had been in Russia. Censorship of any kind of anti-Stalinist idea repressed the cultural lives of Soviet citizens immensely. There's an old joke that they had two TV channels in the Soviet Union. Channel 1 was propaganda, and Channel 2 was a KGB agent shouting at you to change back to Channel 1. This joke combines so much about the USSR the subtle, grumbling dissent that was all that was permitted, the ever-present threat of political coercion, the repression of free information, the propaganda, and the lack of development. Stalin is remembered by many as a war hero. The Soviet Union certainly played the leading role in the defeat of Hitler, but they did so out of a desire to defend their homeland rather than the brutally imposed ideology of Marxism-Leninism. Just look at the concessions to patriotism and religious worship that Stalin made to help the war effort. During the Civil War in 1918-19, you can read the diaries of the young men, and they're saying things like, Communism is the true light. When we've established this perfect society and defeated the white Russians, everything will be better. You don't see so much commitment to the ideology of communism in the 1941 Barbarossa diaries. There it's about defending themselves. And the human cost of Stalin's policies, in wartime and in peacetime, can never be forgotten because they're one of the most stark indicators of the dangers of autocracy. Orlando Fige, Stalinist historian, put it well when he described the legacy of the revolution that Stalin had betrayed. He said, quote, We must strengthen our democracy, not only as a source of freedom but of social justice, so that the disadvantaged and the disillusioned do not reject it again. Note that since the collapse of communism, Stalin's popularity amongst Russians has been on the rise, from a low of 27% in 1994 to 45% in 2011. And yes, that is currently, as I write this, more than the approval rating for Donald Trump. Indeed, Stalin was voted the most popular Russian of all time in a recent, albeit controversial, poll. Some of this is to do with the influence of Putin, of course. In Russia, there will always be those who will view him as a hero for winning the war and establishing the USSR as a global superpower in the same way that people lionise the British Empire and ignore the terrible atrocities that it was associated with. There are those who buy into the propaganda that socialism was only foiled by saboteurs and wreckers, and there are those who feel enough affection for the great leader, the time when Russia was great, who was genuinely beloved by many in his lifetime. They're still willing to buy into this idea that the flames of terror were fanned by those around him. Accepting the harsh history of your own country is often difficult. Even outside Russia, there are still many out there in the world today who defend him, and argue that reports of his crimes are greatly exaggerated. The current regime in Russia is loath to criticise a national hero, and shares enough of his authoritarian characteristics that to do so would be unwise. His support is still on the rise. Stalin's Western defenders are naive or dishonest. They conflate his reign with the dream of fairness and a socialist paradise. Just as in the Communist Manifesto, the criticism of the West and the status quo is far more convincing, eloquent and persuasive than the sketchy explanations of the alternative that they propose. True socialism has never been established. Those who want to argue against this point of view 
are forced into bizarre contortions to defend dictators like Stalin and Mao. It seems clear that Stalin had little interest in establishing socialism, despite his rhetoric, and despite his many speeches and writings on the subject. His principal concern was remaining in power, which he did, ruthlessly and brilliantly, for nearly 30 years. But he was no raving lunatic. Until the very end of his life, he seemed perfectly sane and in control to everyone surrounding him, even though his policies were as often justified by irrational fear as they were by a rational desire to maintain control. He was a complex man, capable of charm and concession, as well as violence and repression. The less one-dimensional portrait we paint of a man like Stalin, the more we allow them detail, nuance and human characteristics, the better equipped we are to understand autocracy and autocrats. The cobbler's son from Gori, the dropout trainee priest, the bank robber, the mass murdering dictator. Stalin was all of these, and he left his mark on history. If we are wise, and if we want to learn lessons from the past, we will never stop discussing it. Thanks for listening to Autocracy Now. That was the last in our series on Stalin. Next time we'll be dealing with quite a different figure. You can email us at autocracynowoutlook.com. Follow us on Twitter at Autocracy Now, and like our page on Facebook. If you want something a little different, you can listen to our sister podcast, Physical Attraction, about physics. Please leave a rating and review on iTunes or your favourite podcatcher. That way, I don't have to paint bridges with our logo. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. We'll be back soon. Until then, be kind to each other. <laughs>